Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome to ASU. Welcome to Tempe. My name is Pat Kenny, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Executive Vice Provost in the Provost Office. It's a great, great privilege and pleasure here to have with us for the 2024 Lecture Series, Democracy at Work. Tonight, we're honored to have David Axelrod and President Michael Crow join us for a conversation about the role of democracy plays in higher education. David Axelrod is the former Chief of Staff for, Barack, for President Barack Obama and preeminent, preeminent American political strategist and commentator. He's the founding director of the University of Chicago's Nonpartisan Institute of Politics and currently serves as a distinguished fellow at the University of Chicago. He is professor of practice here at ASU and senior political commentator for CNN. He is also the host of the Axe Files, a top-rated podcast featuring in-depth conversations with public figures across the political spectrum. And tonight we will be recording for the for the Axe Files podcast. Okay, all yours, David. Dean, are we? My mic on here. Uh, try it again. How about now? There you go. Yeah. Excellent. The microphone is an essential part of a podcast, so I want to make sure <laughs> that mine is working. Uh, President Crow, it's it's. Yep. I'm so happy. My, Michael's fine. You. So, uh, I am uh, so happy to see you and grateful for your for your time. This is a an astonishing place, Arizona State University, but I don't think there's an institution, public institution in the country that more reflects the. The, the, the vision and the uh, personality of uh, the person who runs it. So before we talk about some of the issues uh, regarding the university and our society today, our democracy, I want to, um, I want to ask you a little bit about yourself. Because yours is a pretty unusual journey. Uh, I'm not sure anybody would have predicted that we'd be sitting here today. I think mine was pretty unusual as well. So, um, but your dad was in the military. First of all, the Crows have been here forever, right? Yeah, they came in, uh, my father's ancestors came in the early 1640s from England as indentured servants to Maryland. Uh-huh. And um, I think you said they were uh, farmers and... Farmers, mechanics, things like that, working with their hands. And that was the big thing. So Soldiers, sailors. Soldiers, all of that. Soldiers, sailors, everybody. Yeah. And your dad was a, a sailor? Sailor, right, in the Navy, enlisted guy. And um, and so you you were a military family. You lived in military housing. You yeah, we lived in public housing. We moved everywhere. I was born. All five children in my in my father's family were all born in naval hospitals. Uh huh. And um, I know you lost your mom at an early age. And I read a quote uh, from you that mo was really moving. Um, and it, it was this: It was I was on a park bench in Chicago after my mother died. My father was crying and he told me that I really needed to take care of myself. So for whatever reason, I decided I was responsible. You were nine. Right. Mm -hmm. At that time. Yes. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I, you know, we, we, my, my mother had uh, gotten cancer and died. Uh, in those days, you didn't see your parents if they went into the hospital. You were, a bit, you know, kept away from them. My father was serving in the Navy. He was actually off the coast of Asia at the time and had to come back. We got split up. And so it was like this traumatic thing. And I, I think that I, my expectation was, was that somehow my dad was going to be, you know, have the plan. And my, my dad was so, so shocked, I sense, in a sense, by his high school girlfriend dying, our, our mother, that uh, he just said, I don't really know what to do. You've got to figure it out. And I, You were the oldest. I was the oldest. And... and and he said, you got to figure it out, you know, and, and, and I just remember saying, well, I'm not really sure what that means, but I, how to do that, but I know what the message is. And that is that I've got to somehow figure out, you know, you know, where to go, what to do. At nine. Yeah. Try to. Yeah. <laughs> um, your dad also administered, I mean, I, I, there were some other stories I saw that were yeah. quite astonishing. It was old school, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Disciplinarian, I think, would be a mild term. Mild, yes. Yes. But he paid homeless people to tell you their stories. Yeah, we'd go in Chicago when he was stationed there for a while. We'd go down to, you know, Ohio Street or different streets in, in sort of areas where there were a lot of what he referred to as winos. And he'd 
pay them money to tell us the, his, their, their life story, how they got there. And I don't know what his motivation was. You know, he took us to uh, the Cook County morgue and he paid some guy to pull out some dead kid and show us what happens when you make bad decisions. So I think it affected my siblings more than me. But, uh, you know, I just thought, like, what is this about? But nonetheless, it, I do remember these things. But what you, yeah, one would, as one would, yes. Um, do you, but it, what it speaks to, though, I mean, you have sort of legendary preternatural drive. And it seems like that goes way back to. I mean, everything in our family was, you know, it's this, it was a working class family. You know, in 1965, you know, I, I looked up on a chart that my dad's pay from the Navy was below the poverty line, which is why we got uh, peanut butter from the government, cheese from the government, powdered milk from the government, lived in public housing, uh, lived in trailer parks, you know, all these kinds of things. And so the drive was not a function of what we didn't have or, or, or whatever. It was just that in our family, and I think probably in the tradition of our family, it was, you know, you work. And so it was about work, you know, gaining some value from work. So the, I think the drive was, uh, came from that partly. You, uh, you uh, I read that you moved 21 times when you were a kid, yeah, Seven, 17 different school. Yeah, my uh, freshman dorm in Friley Hall at Iowa State was the longest place I'd ever lived in one building my and, freshman year. So. And how, how, did that, how, did, how did that affect you as a kid? Because you probably dropped in schools in the middle of the year. You didn't it, know it, anybody. It, it was highly, highly disruptive, and I learned to disdain most of my teachers because, because the way that... I only stayed in one place, and I learned that. But they, it was... Uh, it, it was the way that they treated me. So they would say, oh, really, too bad for you, uh, kid, you know, because, you know, we learned commas last year and, and you haven't learned them yet. And so too bad for you. So, so I was constantly being, well, why don't you go play with these rats or, or, or why don't you go, you know, read on your own? And so I, I started reading, you know, when I was 11 or 12 years old, just basically becoming a consumer of everything a library had to offer imaginable. Um, but it sounded like you spent a lot of time alone. Well, I mean, we, you know, there were five children, but I, you know, you know, it, it was, it was not a lot. We went to working class schools. Uh, some of the schools were majority minority schools. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been mugged. You know, it's, 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 uh, if you look at my hands, there's, uh, there's little marks on my hands. Those are little boys teeth <laughs> and they're not, then they're, they're not all victories. Uh, you know, some, some. <laughs> Some are losses, but but not alone. I mean, uh, in, in, in ensconced in trying to learn. Um, there's one story that 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 stuck out to me that seems, in certain ways, to have um, to have been foundational, and it was a story about your your uh, Eagle Scout project. Right. You became an Eagle Scout when you were 13, mm -hmm. kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, and your project was to collect enough food to feed a family for a year. Is that one the, year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk about that and the night yeah. on Christmas Eve when you dropped the food off. Yeah. So, so the year is 1968. So my dad was in the Navy. Uh, we were living in different military bases in Norfolk, Virginia, and a place called Patuxent River, Maryland, with a Patuxent River Naval Air Station in St. Mary's County, Maryland. And so. I was working on my Eagle project uh, in the summer of 1968 through the fall of 1968. So Dr. King is killed in April of 68. Uh, Senator Kennedy is killed in June of 68. The, uh, uh, so my mind is really fixed on these things. And the Chicago Convention of the, De of the Democratic Party is in the summer. And then the Tet Offensive, where a number of our family friends were killed. And so it's 1968 was this like really, really focused time in my own thinking. And so this other kid, Randy, and I decided to collect enough food for one family for one year. Turns out that's a lot of food. You fill up a 24-foot U-Haul truck and another smaller truck. We get a name from the county welfare department of a family, uh, and we go to the family on Christmas Eve uh, to deliver the food. And so we're going down a, a paved road, then a dirt road, and then a two-lane track through like a field. We get back to this house. Now, we live in government housing, nothing fancy living off government commissary and government food supplements on a low salary, uh, you know, one pair, two pairs of blue jeans a year, you know, that kind of thing. And these people had uh, a tar paper shack, tar paper on the outside, knock on the door, open the door, the floor is dirt. Uh, there's a pot belly stove, there's four children, two adults. And, and uh, I ended up knowing one of the kids because he was in my school. 
Uh, this was Christmas Eve, 1968. The family was very happy and very excited. And I felt, I felt kind of shocked. It's not like I didn't know there was poverty below where we were. I didn't know that, but I didn't, I didn't think of it as somebody that I knew, this kid, African-American family. They were in the old sharecropper's house of whatever this farm had been in the past. And um, so we go home that night. After that, everybody was excited. And then my dad had borrowed money that he didn't have to buy a color TV. And that's the very night that Apollo 8 is circling the moon and uh, sent back pictures live from the moon. Some of you might have been alive then. And, uh, and I remember this like switch went off in my head and it was, it wasn't like WTF because I didn't think that way, but. But I, the equivalent. Yes, the equivalent, yeah. yeah. And so, and so I, I, I saw this incongruence and knew that something was unbelievably wrong. How could you do that? Orbit the moon. And at the same time, these people lived in a tar paper shack and were, had little boys collecting food for them. And so I just knew there was something wrong. The reason that that uh, stuck out to me is that um, it, it seems like an epiphany. You talk about the mission of this university right. um, and that experience, and you can almost draw a straight line from there to here in terms of both the commitment to, um, to uh, equality of, of opportunity and technology, it, it all in one story. It was an epiphany. I happened to have read that same year as, a, as a, an eighth grader, uh, uh, Sir Thomas More's 16th century uh, uh, idea of a utopian place. And I remember reading it and thinking it was stupid. Uh, that was the mind of a of an eighth grader. Uh, and then I, and then I also read, uh, I was reading a lot of Cicero at the library and I was attracted to Cicero because, because he was always focused on what you could construct. So there's this phrase attributed to him that I criticized by what I create. And so, and that was also a, an unbelievable, even then in 1968, Star Trek fan of the first original show. Yeah. And so there was this utopian notion that somehow got in my mind that science and technology was a way to work on some of these issues or work on some of these problems. So that became something that I focused on. And, and you decided that you needed to go to college to yeah. pursue that. Yeah, no one had ever been to college in my family. My great-grandmother, who was still alive, she was born in the 1880s. She was a really old, salt person, racist, you know, everything you could possibly imagine. And when I finished my uh, PhD, just to give you some sense of my family, she said, well, Michael, you know, you got your BS, and we know what that is. <laughs> then you got your MS, and that's more of the same. And now you got your PhD, which is an acronym for piled higher and deeper. So, the, so, the, <laughs> so, so, the, so, the, so the level of respect coming from the leadership of my family for my <laughs> pursuit of my PhD was de minimis. And so I, I, I was really focused on going to college and seeing if, if I could do something other than just work to make machines work or work to make money for other people. And but could I work on something that could help this? problem of why we weren't making it towards. So there's Sir Thomas More, I don't know if you remember, like his view of the utopian was that we're all farmers. Everybody has the same status. Everybody has the same rank and there's no technology and everybody lives happily ever after. I'm like, no. And then, and then, and it, and it seemed like, it seemed like we had no other pathway to move forward. So I was really interested in going to college to figure out how to do that. And uh, you went to college. I, I saw somewhere that you were disappointed. You wanted to take five majors. Yeah, I walked up to the table and, at Iowa State where I was going to be a javelin thrower, where I was a javelin thrower. And I walk up to this table and the lady goes, uh, I said, she says, what do you want to major in? I said, I got five things. And I rattle them all off. She says, well, I only need one. I want to major in five. She says, you can't. I said, well, where does it say that? And so, and so, so I'm she, sure they were happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so she said, I'm assigning you to distributed studies with all of the other dummies. <laughs> So I ended up majoring in two subjects and minoring in three subjects, all five of the ones that I listed that day. Yeah. So the ones you listed, I guess uh, I read were engineering, linguistics, po po political science, history, and anthropology. No, the another right? one was uh, environmental science. So, so which uh, you did study there, but um, here you've sort of made a practice of creating these interdisciplinary studies. Uh, and I, so I was wondering if there was a relationship. Well, the, the relationship was, I, I, it was kind of funny, like, like when I was in high school and doing all this reading, and, and then ultimately when I was look, looked at things, I had concluded that there was, if we had all these problems, so I remember, you know, the 
the rivers in Ohio were on fire. And the reason I was interested in environmental science, there were all these kinds of issues. And so what I knew was that Randy Newman wrote a whole song about. Yes. That. Yes. I know that. I like yeah. that song. And so and so what I what I thought was even then, even as a high school senior and a college freshman was that, well, who built all these chemicals that kill everyone? I literally who built all these chemicals? And I, you come to find out that the chemists built all those chemicals. And it's not like they were evil or didn't have forethought. That's what they built. And so could, could you design something to build something in a different way? So I started concluding that we were limiting ourselves. And I had a, I had a fabulous uh, undergraduate advisor named Don Hadwiger, who was this uh, Oklahoma wild guy, sort of out of the Depression era. And he says, he says well, Michael, I don't really care what you, what you uh, want to take. You're going to get on the right track. When you need some help, you come back and see me. And here's all the forms to take whatever courses you want to, you want to take. And so it didn't help my grade point to take all these courses without the prerequisites. I mean, you really take a pounding when you do that. But, but what I could tell was that we had something missing in the design of how knowledge is advanced. Something was missing. I didn't know what it was. You, um, you also you did, you did some engineering. You worked on... Um, environmental remediation. Right. Uh, university hired you to go talk to the legislature yeah. about you when you were what nineteen or something. Yeah, they had they had a project. This is right at the energy crisis, and I in Iowa they decided that the way out of the the Middle Eastern energy crisis was to dig up all the coal in Iowa and burn it. Well, the problem is that the Iowa land is so valuable and so productive, and the problem with the Iowa coal is that it was so filled with sulfur, and so the project was designed to solve those two problems. And I worked in the field on those projects, solving those problems. But then they said that nobody in the legislature understands what we're doing. And so, and so the, the old time scientists, all of whom were like born in the 19 teens, the people that I worked for were all born between 1917 and 1920. They said, you seem to be able to understand this stuff. Go down there and explain it to them. So I started driving down to the state legislature in Des Moines twice a week, explaining to them what we were doing. And did they understand? They understood it well enough to make informed decisions. They kept our funding going. Yeah. Oh, job well done. <laughs> that, that was probably good preparation for the job you have now, too. Right? It, was, it was preparation in how to translate, yes. How to translate <laughs> from A to B, language A to and language B. You, uh, you worked in the energy uh, area for uh, several years, and then you went and got your doctorate, as you mentioned, at, at Syracuse University. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to compress some, uh, some of the history here. Um, and then you ended up, uh, you went back to Iowa State. Yes. And Senator Harkin called me up one day and said, uh, uh, it looks like you've gone off and gotten yourself some education. And so you need to come back and help us advance some new projects. And so one of the problems for Iowa is that a lot of people don't come back yeah, right. uh, when they leave to get their education. You were the director of science and technology. Right there and that really became your your niche and you ended up going to columbia university right. to do that same work yeah talk about the work that you did at columbia because it was a kind of foreshadowing of what you've done here but you the you built um you know basically a center for innovation yeah so i had three jobs there so one job was to drive technologies into creation so we took about 400 technologies public and we did about 4,000 licenses of advanced technologies and we did this in a lot of areas to you know build better drugs build better solution build better materials better devices uh, and then uh, I was also a faculty member there and, and got tenure there uh, I also was uh, involved in designing and launching a thing called the Earth Institute at Columbia which was a, an attempt to draw together a number of disparate disciplines so the public health people didn't work with the earth scientists didn't work with the engineers the earth scientists didn't work with the biologists, didn't work with the ecologists. And so, so a fantastic. I, I spent 10 years building this Earth Institute, and it was unbelievable fun, unbelievably uh, instructive in terms of what was needed. Even this building that we're in here, the Center for Planetary Health, the Global Futures Laboratory, these are all things that couldn't be done at Columbia because there were just limits to what the, the faculty innovation rate was at, at that institution. In spite of their, their great achievements, their, you know, their ability to move in new directions you know, uh, wasn't uh, something that was as high on their agenda. Yeah, I want to ask you more about that uh, a little bit later, about the barriers to change and to overcoming inertia in, in, uh, in institutions. Um, while you were there, 
uh, you also became chair of InQtel. Explain what InQtel is, because I was fascinated. I didn't even know this existed. So in 1999, February 1999, in late fall of 1998, there was uh, uh, an, the Indians detonated a, a nuclear device without anyone at the uh, American government knowing what was going on. And there was a deep shock that somehow we didn't have the technologies that we needed from the civilian technology stream that ought to be in the government, that there was a barrier. So the intelligence community and the defense community said, well, we need to de devise some way where we can find these technologies and speed them into the protection and defense of the United States. So a new thing was set up, a not-for-profit entity called InQtel. And what it does is it invests in technologies uh, from all over the country, now all over the world, that are sped into use. So for instance, InQtel was in the top five initial investors of a company called Keyhole. Keyhole was the precursor company to Google Earth. Uh, you might have heard of a company called Palantir. So InQtel was one of the early investors there. So InQtel has made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of investments. And then these technologies have been sped into uh, national defense. And then the proceeds of our investments allowed us to generate revenue back to InQtel, uh, low billions of dollars. And those low billions of dollars then become a perpetual machine. So I've been on that board for- You're still there. I'm the, I've been the chairman for 17 years. I've been on the board for 25 years. Are you getting the knack for it? Yeah, 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 we have a knack. <laughs> uh, it's, it's quite, it's, quite it's, it's, a, it's an area of, you know, giving back a little bit to public service. I, I, I didn't serve in the military and I was the first male in many, 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 many generations not to do that. So I didn't necessarily feel good about that. Let me ask you something about technology. Um, you're obviously, steeped in it you've applied it here um in terms of uh, uh how teaching is done uh as well as building the same kind of program that you had at columbia you've expanded research here sevenfold um you're an aficionado of technology um so you can make the case for how important it is that we stay on top of technology. I'm here as a Luddite. Mm -hmm. I'm a little worried about mm -hmm. the pace of technological change yes. and our ability as a society to get our arms around it, and particularly in the information yeah. technology. Well, I, I, sh I share your concern, and, and you're, you're not a Luddite. I mean, you have technology on your face called glasses, which alter the light going to the back of your eye, from which the signal to your brain is altered. You're wearing a series of very advanced materials on your body called clothes. You have a watch somewhere. Thank God for that. Yeah, uh, but, but what I'm saying is that we're all technology users and technology aficionados because okay. our species is incapable of survival without dramatic uses of technology. But what's happened is because we've so underinvested in human capital because so many educational institutions operate on what's called the deficit model, which is that there's a few smart people, there's some okay people, and there's a bunch of not so smart people. Uh, what we have is we, 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 have, we have slowed up our opportunity to use technology across a broadly educated population to the benefit of everyone rather than to the benefit of a few. And so, and so uh, I, have, I have every concern that I'm sure that you have and every caution, uh, but that doesn't keep me from thinking that we ought to move ahead and, and then yeah. find ways to move ahead where we can bring about advantage. And we've done a lot of that here at ASU in terms of advantage. Let me, let me just engage you on one, the, the point that worries me the most because it's the thing that I focus on the most, and that is the impact of uh, social media on democracy yes. and sort of our coherence as a society. Because the business model of social media is to keep people online and buy things. Yeah. Uh, and their great inspiration has been that the thing that does that is outrage, anger, resentment. And we get driven into these silos yes that separate us and, and um, uh, that alienate us from others. Well, not only that, but I mean, uh, all the tech, I mean, the technology breakthrough of radio was hugely empowering to Hitler and the rise of Nazism and, the, and ultimately his takeover of Germany, his political manipulation of the masses through the use of that technology is highly, highly, highly uh, uh, correlated. Likewise- He didn't have big data. No, I know. And so he, he didn't have what exists now. And right. So, so uh, uh, Steve, Steve Bannon's old company, Cambridge Analytica, and other things that have been used as ways to analyze this data, make predictive analytics, decide where you want to put your emphasis, uh, change your political strategy and your communication strategy on a moment's notice. 
what happened is that those technologies got out ahead of us, greed took over, political avarice is the function of being empowered by those that are greedy that, that develop these technologies. So these technologies are without regulation for the most part, or without sufficient regulation. They're without sufficient understanding. Uh, we had conversations with companies, uh, the big alphabet companies years ago, and we said, you all are heading into a train wreck. The train wreck is going to be uh, probably not uh, mortal, but nearly mortal. You have no idea what you're doing. You're not, you need to start thinking about consequences. You need to start thinking about how do you manage these technologies to a net positive outcome as opposed to a net neutral or net negative outcome. And so these are things that we, we haven't done. And, and what's happened also is that things are accelerating so quickly in the use of the technology. The, 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 politi the political vehemence is, you know, no different than the lies of Thomas Jefferson against John Adams. They're just spread over and over and over and over right. and over uh, and in ways in which no one can even manage or sort, you know, the truth from, from, from lies yeah. as easily. And so it's it's a problem. We're going to have to address it, and we need to address it soon. Yeah, I think um, additionally, the nature of democracies democracies are that we're designed to move slowly when we're divided. Yes. And this technology divides us at a time when it also makes people more uh, anxious and angry about the pace of change. You know, so it also activates it's a caustic in, mismatch. It also activates in some people, and some psychologists are looking at this a fear index, which is accelerated to a point where they become desperate in some of their conducts and their behaviors. As we've seen. Yes. And so, and so, the, and, 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 and if you listen to the people that were uh, convicted on for the January 6th crimes, listen to them weeping, crying, you know, I thought this was true. I'm sure they did. They, I'm sure they, I mean, I had, I had, you know, I had little sympathy for their actions. I had sympathy for where their heart and mm -hmm. head were now, because look at what they thought they were doing. Right. Uh, and so they were tricked. Mm -hmm. And they were tricked on purpose. Yeah. I just, um, I, I, I worry about the exponential sort of nature of technology that is churning so fast that we as societies can't get our arms around it. Well, that's what's happened. You know, that's what, that's what uh, hedge funds live off of. Uh, and that's what the stock market is also driven by. And so we, we don't at the moment have sufficient regulation. We started a school which is still nascent. Uh, called the School for the Future of Innovation and Society in our Global Futures College. It's just getting going. We've tried to build tools. One of our professors built a tool called uh, 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 Technology Assessment. How do, you techno how do you assess the impact of technologies going forward? But it's all nascent, and no one's putting any, any, any money into this part of the problem. They're just putting money into more computational time, more, more, more uh, technology, faster technologies, and so we're not putting enough energy into all these other things. You know, um, one of the questions that you, I, I mentioned the exponential increase in research here of uh, 4,750 uh, 4, invention disclosures, uh, 1,151 patents, 230 startups, uh, generating $2 billion in economic output in Arizona alone. You've also formed alliances with uh, Starbucks, Google, Adidas, uh, and corporations to provide um, uh, remote learning yes. uh, to their employees. My, my work day yesterday was in Shanghai, so you can, you can spend the whole day in Shanghai. So my meeting started at 8 with uh, a woman named Belinda, who's the CEO of uh, Starbucks for China. They have uh, 90,000 90, employees and oh, no, 60,000 employees and 9,000 stores. And so we're talking about how to... Uh, develop the human beings that are working at Starbucks like Starbucks like we are here. So what we found here is that if you use technologies and design them in a different way, you can you can take a university and all of its creative energy, its faculty, its drive, its its ambitions, and you can you can create ways to teach and educate across the entire society at scale. And so we found a way to do that using these this unbelievably innovative faculty that we have and this unbelievably a powerful set of technologies that we brought together with our faculty, which means then that there's over 30 million people in the United States that went to college and didn't finish. The only industrialized country where more people go to college and don't finish than, than finish, the only one. And so how do we go back? So we've now found 85,000 of those people and helped them to graduate with a full scale, full ASU degree designed by our faculty. And we did that with all of these technology innovations. Do you, uh, just about the, uh, the, the sort of merging of uh, corporations and university and so on. I'm sure 
people raise the raise concerns about whether it impacts your independence as a the head of a public institution. Well, what's interesting, yeah. So you, you hear a lot of that, and a lot of that's so. So we don't give control over to anybody. You know, we we you know, we, there's there's nobody at Starbucks that controls ASU, and there's nobody at ASU that controls Starbucks. We're focused on delivering an educational opportunity to people at Starbucks. At, they're called partners who went to college and didn't finish. Uh, or who never had a pathway to college. And so we have this thing every year, every graduation, fall semester and spring semester, we have the Starbucks Cry Fest. So the Cry Fest goes something like this. 700 people graduating show up with their family members. The CEO of Starbucks is in the room. I'm in the room. Other people are in the room. And then they tell their stories. I was at Princeton, and my mother got cancer, and I left and didn't tell anyone, and they flunked me out, and I couldn't go back to college. Mm -hmm. now, whether or not they could or not, that's what they thought. Uh, you know, I, 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 I tried uh, cocaine once and became addicted and my life at college was ruined. And 10 years later, I realized I need to fix it and couldn't fix it. I ran out of money. My father died. My mother and pa my parents were killed in car crashes. I mean, they go through all these stories and the system is so merciless. It is so merciless that there's no way to finish. And so we've now pr pr found this way to finish. In fact, we've learned so much about how to do that. We found a way that you know, if you went to jail at age 17 and you want to still go to college, we have a way for you to earn your way in by these, these technology tools that we've designed and built. And so, so we figured out how to do this, and we think it's a, an important service. This is so much better than I thought, because when you said Starbucks cry fest, I thought it was when someone got their latte and it was no, no, no. whole milk instead of skim. Now, yesterday, so, so yesterday, so I, I say the, the, the woman, Belinda, you know, who's the CEO of Starbucks, we're in this roastery, this unbelievable facility in downtown Shanghai. And, and so she says, you know, what do you want? And, you know, I'm, I'm not a big coffee person. And so, so I said, do you have a refresher, which is ground green coffee and a fruit drink? And she said, no, we don't have those. And I, and so I said, do you have green tea? And she says, we have that. So then they bring me this thing made of something matcha or something. I don't know what it is, but I mean, it's just like, it was like this, ult, this green thing with white thing on the top. And I tasted it and I thought, this is actually quite horrible. And so, <laughs> so did you, but did you drink it? I drank a few sips of it. I thought maybe you had the whole thing because you seem to be pretty alert for a guy who was in Shanghai yesterday. Yeah. Well, we just, you know, I, I was, I was, it was unbelievable. I was just showing some people a, a video of, uh, I went by an incubator that they're building that will hold uh, over, over uh, 20,000 companies or new startup companies in one set of buildings that took us, took us, it was over a mile long. Wow the string of buildings and all the buildings are 25 to 35 stories high. And, and they, they, they just called it an incubator. I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you let, when you uh, were at Columbia, Columbia yeah. is perhaps one of the most exclusive yeah. universities yes. in the world. I mean, it, uh, I, I, I think I mentioned to you, I just for preparing for this, I, was curious, and I looked up, and they and they uh, boast that they uh, admit 3.7 percent of the people who applied. You came here, and you sort of turned that model on its head. Yeah, well, Columbia is a private university, um, has an honors college called Columbia College, has a number of uh, graduate schools built around it, and they run that like an honors college with very limited number of seats. They haven't, they don't want to grow the seats. There was an argument there when I was there for like five years about growing Columbia College by 50 students. You know, and, and so, and so, and so, yeah, and they did it. Uh, and so uh, with great reluctance, and the, the joke is, you know, we considered the matter for four semesters, 87 academic senators vote yes, one votes no, the matter fails. And so, and so, <laughs> so what has been missing in the United States is the evolution of truly public, truly egalitarian universities. I gave a speech in, invited speech in 2012 at the University of Illinois on the 150th anniversary of the, of the Land-Grant Act, the Morrill Act. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the University of Illinois was one of the original land-grant universities. And I go there, and I'm one of the moral lecturers talking about the future of higher education. And I remember, and I don't know if any of them are going to listen to this, so we'll see what happens when they hear it. But So I sort of asked the question, if the Morrill Act, which was, can you build me a college focused on the sons and daughters of farmers and mechanics, and can you focus on food supply and industry and solving problems and helping people to be successful? And can you work with everybody? I said, how many of you would sign up for a deal like that today if that was coming along? And I didn't get many hands in the room. 
Hmm. I didn't get many hands in the room. And so, and so a number of people along the road, along the way, Frank Rhodes, uh, who was the uh, president at Cornell uh, right before, in the late 1990s, wrote a book called Creating the Future. And it was really an apology about what he thought Cornell University should have done and could have been and might have done. And then a guy named Jim Duderstadt wrote a book called The University for the 21st Century. And so coming out of that was this notion of we have a serious design problem. We've decided in the United States that excellence is a function of who is admitted and how exclusive was the admission process. And that is the sign of excellence only. Now that's a sign of something, but it's not a sign of necessary. So people call that, they call universities with limited admissions elite. Well, that's about as British before the revolution as you can possibly imagine. Yeah. Uh, because it means you're, you're admitted and, and not very many are admitted. And if you look at the, you know, there's nothing wrong with this model, but it, it's an incomplete model. And so what we didn't it's have- It's a word that's not trading very high these days. Yes, I, I, I realize that. And, there's, and they're correlated. These problems are correlated. Yeah. And so it was kind of funny. Like I, I was born in California. We lived in California several times. And I remember reading uh, 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 about uh, the emergence of the University of California when I was in high school. And you go back and you can read this book called The Blue and the Gold about how it was formed and so forth. And what was weird about it was how egalitarian the design was. So on my desk in my office, just a short distance from here, is the catalog of the University of California from the summer of 1950. University of California at Los Angeles, summer of 1950. To get into that university, you needed to have a B average from a California high school. You needed to have a B in 15 particular courses to make sure you were ready and could do college level work. And the tuition was free. Where did that go? Where's that model? So we, we're, we're working to be as close to that mo model as we can possibly be. So we have those admission standards and we admit every kid that meets those admission standards. If you don't have the money to come to ASU, we have the money for you to go to ASU. We'll work it out between our investment and the federal government's investment and philanthropy and so forth. And if you don't have it, we'll, we'll make that work for you. So our net tuition now uh, across all of our Arizona undergraduates is under $3,000. That's, that's what does it cost to go here for a year uh, uh, if you, and with no loans, under $3,000. And so we have built this model. I think I was saying to you earlier, if you were designing an American, a truly American university, not an offshoot of a German university or an offshoot of a British college at Oxford or Cambridge, what would it look like? It would be highly egalitarian. It would be highly agile. It would be highly innovative. It would be connected to the people. It would work to serve the people in every possible way. That's what Frank Rhodes said. That's what Jim Duderstadt said. That's what a whole series of other writers said. No one has ever tried to do it at the scale that our team here has been able to do it and our faculty have been able to do it. Is here. this what you, was, was this what you were thinking when you took Absolutely. this job? It was an, because it's, it was probably an unusual move, right? To go from they held the Ivy League to... Now they literally, when I left, when I left Columbia, they said, you are nuts. There's something wrong with you. Like what has, what has happened to you? That's what people told me when I left the newspaper business yeah. to go into politics. Yes. Yeah. And so they literally, they held, they held their wake for me. So, so, uh, so before, before I took this job, there were, uh, five or six universities that were interested in me being their president. And I, I went and talked to them and they were said, we'd like you to be the president. And I said, no. And my wife said, I can't keep going through this emotional stuff. I mean, write down a list of universities that you would say yes to if they, if they wanted you to be there. So I wrote down three schools. Third was the University of Washington, because I thought in King County, Washington, one of the most innovative places that exists in the entire world, with all the companies that are formed there, maybe you could build a new kind of university around the already really excellent University of Washington. The second was the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, because in all the trips that I'd made to the front range and all the 14ers that I'd climbed in Colorado, all I saw was this spirit of wanting to be innovative. And the number one on my list was this school, Arizona State University, because of where it was, what it's going on here, what Arizona is like, what Phoenix was like. And so none of them were open and this one came open and they were crazy enough to hire me. And that was 22 years ago. Yeah, that's a, that's a long time to be the president of a, a university or anything. It's all, there's always a chance that I'm actually dead. You don't really exist. And and, and, and I've just been doing this for a long time. And, you know, if so, I'm pretty happy with the outcome, but you know, I think I'm still alive. Yes. I, I, I would, I, I can just from here, I can attest to that. Yes. So, uh, but you, um, uh, but it's an interesting question because, you know, I, I mean, I started this Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago 
it, 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 it is small, very small scale operation compared to this. But I left after 10 years of my own volition because I was worried that I would lose my entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spark and that I wanted renewal. Um, does that worry you at all? I mean, you seem like uh, you have a font of ideas, but. That definitely doesn't worry me. And so, and so the one thing, when you're at an institution with 6,000 faculty members like we have, uh, have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of degree programs, 250 academic units, 20 colleges, you're working at the edge of so many things, new ways to teach in the humanities, new ways to teach in the arts, new ways to teach in fashion and design, new ways to build this college of global futures. I mean, it is, it is impossible to imagine that there isn't an opportunity for unbelievably creative acts by our team and our faculty to make new things happen in new kinds of ways. And we just, we, we, you know, we've built 35 new schools. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we used to have a, a few dozen astronomy majors. As an example, we now have 700 undergraduate astronomy majors, half on campus, half online, inside a school of earth and space exploration with disciplines that weren't typically working together, now all working together. We have a school for human evolution and social change. We have uh, schools where philosophy and history and relig religious studies have come together. So all- I wanna want ask you about this, uh, the, the school of human evolution and social change because I read about when this came into being, which yeah. was early in your- yes tenure that uh, some of the folks in the anthropology department were- Was the core, right? Were outraged. Oh, more than I, outraged. One, one fact I remember referred to me as a thug in a suit. Yes, I've got that here. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't wear a suit today. I don't, I don't even, I only own one suit. So I, I, I'm a thug in a sport coat. <laughs> yes, that's, that, that's better, I think. Uh, but how, how hard is it to implement wholesale changes, how do you, how do you create a culture yeah. that is accepting of that yeah. when there's tremendous inertia in, in particularly well, no, in public institutions? Yeah, there's, there's more than inertia. There's, you know, you're surrounded by, you know, wannabe geniuses, geniuses, pseudo geniuses, hyper geniuses, polymaths, polyglots, you know, everything that you can possibly imagine around you. And so, and so it's extremely hard and, and you must approach it from the perspective of culture. And so uh, the, if, so what, what, what I proposed was uh, a public university that would be focused on inclusion versus exclusion as the measurement of our success, that we would take responsibility. I mean, I got so sick of listening to people tell me that it was someone else's problem that K-12 was underperforming. Okay, we produce all the teachers, we produce all the principals, we produce all the teaching materials, we produce all the evaluation stuff, and someone else is responsible, we're responsible. So in our, what is now our charter, we have those, we have three points, inclusion versus exclusion and measured student success, research that measurably benefits the public in some way that you can get the public to understand it, and then taking responsibility for the communities that we, that we serve, economic development, social development, cultural development, health and well-being, and so forth. Well, it turns out, and there's some faculty in here, you know, our faculty are, for the most part, above 80% attracted to that objective. And so, and then if you then empower that faculty and say, you are freed from the normal, completely inane academic bureaucracy, you are freed from it, if you wanna be. And that is you can design where you wanna go and what you wanna do and how you wanna do these things and we'll help to empower that and help to make that happen. Uh, this room that you're in, this, this, this you know, college of global futures, this global futures laboratory, the, the, the way that we have evolved that, that's an example, there's 700 faculty members involved in that through self-selection. There's a hundred core faculty members in, there's four schools in that college. The School of Sustainability, the first in the country, and now there's hundreds. The School for the Future of Innovation and Society, which is, we're trying to get that off the ground. The School for Complex Adaptive Systems, how do you actually run a very complicated world? And what math tools and decision tools that you need? And then a School for the Future of the Oceans. Now, none of those exist anywhere else in that particular form, and they all exist here together. Our faculty designed all of those are advancing on all of those. And they're all very, very hard projects, all very hard so things to do. created a culture and the, and the uh, innovation and entrepreneurialism yep. bubbles up from the... If you empower it. So most universities are crippled. And I was a trustee of Bowdoin College for many years in, in Brunswick, Maine, one of the New England, um, mm -hmm. you know, super, super focused colonial colleges. Uh, and and 
if you alter the culture and empower the fact that to be designers and then you actually follow up with something, everything changes. And then if you also make the social commitment. So our student body in, in our past was never representative of the democracy. Yeah, I, w I wanted to ask about that because it, it, it would seem that a natural outgrowth of your approach would be a much more representative student body. So we, we weren't representative. So we have about 40,000 Pell eligible undergraduates here. We have about 30,000 first generation college students here. You know, we have very large numbers, but those are very large numbers also. So when we started, we were not representative of socioeconomic. I think almost half minority in your yeah. entering class. Yes, right. More, well, uh, yes. Uh, and so, so what we decided was that the university was not successful unless we had a student body reflective of all socioeconomic grouping. So, so I was raised in a family in the bottom quarter of family incomes. And in 1970, when I was in high school, uh, about 7 or 8% of the people from those families ever graduated from college. And 50 years later, 55 years later, 9%. We got a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, kids that aren't very smart and haven't worked very hard in the upper quarter of family incomes, you ought to see it in the upper 10% of family incomes, they all went to college. And so, we we have, and so what we decided was our student body would come equally from all four of the quadrants of family incomes. And so our student body never did before and has for the last... 12 or 13 years, been representative of all family income distributions in the United States. The second we did that, oh, isn't it amazing? The school's already then as ethnically diverse as the population. So the second you eliminate the financial barrier, the school becomes as diverse as the population ethnically. And so we've never had any ethnic goals. We've never had any goals, uh, diversity goals ever, except that the student body must represent, represent the totality of the economic distribution of the families in the country. And you've improved uh, in terms of completion and- Oh, we've more than, we've increased uh, by two and a half times the four year graduation rate. We've taken our uh, retention rate to just under 90%. We're, we're, we're operating at the same level uh, as other major historic institutions, which are not as representative of the totality of the, of the population as we are. Um, let me ask you about being a, uh, uh, a university administrator, university president, in this time, particularly a public university, because, uh, you know, I work on campuses, we all read about what's going on, and you, you yourself have experienced some of the controversies around free expression. Yes, um, I or think at least as they're portrayed in the media, because there's, there's what really happened, and then there's what the media thinks happened, and they're often not the same. You sound like some of my old clients. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, Tell me about your, how do you manage this? You had a conserv very conservative speakers here last fall mm -hmm. that created a controversy. The left was mad at you. Faculty was mad at you. Yeah. A conservative donor was mad at you because he thought yeah. the conservatives weren't welcome. Yeah. Uh, some legislators, some state legislators, because you have to respond to a legislature. Yes. I'm yeah, reminding I mean, you of painful things here, I know. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's kind of funny. We're a university. We're not a public park. And so if our students and our faculty uh, want to have speakers here and the speakers are not purveyors of uh, uh, hate speech or genocide uh, or something that's, you know, death to this group or death to that group or death to this thing or that thing, because that's outside of our of our uh, code of conduct. Uh, you know, we do everything we can to allow those speakers to be able to be here. And the, the, the way I know that we are doing a good job at that is I am attacked from 360 degrees. Every, every possible group, religious groups, political groups, uh, uh, labor groups, uh, everyone you can possibly imagine. And so what we do is we try to maintain as much order as possible. You, 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 if you disrupt a meeting, you're asked to leave. You can't, you know, so it's just, it's just, we just try to be as ordered and as focused as we can be The some of the groups that, you know, they have, they have views that are, you know, maybe not views that I share or would ever share or could even conceive of. Uh, but there's a group of students or a group of faculty members that want to have them on campus. So uh, if, if they're not doing the other thing then, that I just mentioned, then, then they're welcome. And then we have to protect the process by protecting the process of the university. So let's say that 
I'm a highly controversial speaker and you're interviewing me and this is the room that we're sitting here. But we can't have people kicking the doors down and breaking into the room like happened at Berkeley yesterday. Uh, we, you know, we, 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 we can't have people standing up in the middle of the room disrupting. That's, that's not free speech. Free speech is you get to say what you think, but you don't get to disrupt an educational process. So we sort of go this balance between educational process, the role of the university, and being as open as possible. Now, you know, we did have uh, two employees of a, of, a, of a group that we had allowed people to speak from. Uh, assault uh, one of our instructors. I saw that. Yeah, and so and so those people now have been charged by the county attorney, and you know more power to the legal process to bring justice because it turns out you 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 can't walk up to someone and start attacking them, harassing them, and then push them to the ground, and then they cut their face and get away with it. So, but one of the people who spoke last fall was a founder of that group. Yes, that they uh, Turning Point USA. Yes. Um, does that? make you rethink the wisdom of hosting him? Well, I mean... Charlie Kirk. Yes, I believe me, I know who it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, Just here to be helpful. Yes, uh, so uh, we're waiting for the judicial process to uh, take its, its course, and if these people are convicted of those offenses, then there's going to have to be some, uh, some response and some contrition from that group, and if they were here as employees, then I don't know how they can... How they can continue to operate as a as a normal group because they have paid thugs. So how do you handle when someone from the legislature says we don't like how you handled that? We don't we're 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 unhappy that our guy was not treated well or was not welcomed and yeah. well luckily in in uh, one of the one aspect of these of these jobs as university presidents is you know, I don't think I've had one day here where there hasn't been some pile of unbelievable complaints about something that we've done or decided or irritated someone or something, and not one day. And, 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 so, and so what we do is we always listen. What is the person saying? What is the kernel of what they're saying? So, so in this particular case where people were very upset about, about uh, the fact that we had some faculty in one of our programs against someone being here, I think these people forgot that our faculty get to have free speech also. And so then they, so then they, they charged uh, our faculty with trying to manipulate student thinking and uh, all kinds of other things. So we investigated that. We brought in an outside uh, lawyer to interview everyone and talk to everyone, and there were no findings to that effect. Okay. So then we go back to them. We say there's no findings, and they say, they say, well, you know, you're lying. I said, well, actually, we're not in the practice of lying. We hired someone else to do this. You can read their report. You can talk to them. Uh, you can make your own assessments. We're not lying. And, 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 so, and then we just go on. And so, and that's what we do. Has the environment gotten worse? Well, what's happened is it's almost funny sometimes. Like sad, I guess. I don't know what you'd say, but so it's kind of funny. Like I'll hear from some person about us not protecting free speech and then hear from the same person about some guy we're not supposed to have on campus. And, and so, and so I think what we have is we don't have a good concept of free speech. So, so uh, we have fought and won many lawsuits over these issues. So we had, one group of students, and this is all since I've been here, and these are things that we decided. So we had one group of students, that uh, one religious group that said, we want to use your university facilities for our meetings, and people from that religious group can't come to our meetings. We said, then you can't use our facilities. Our facilities and our meetings are open to whoever wants to come. And they said, well, we're going to sue you. And I like, sue away. And, you know, a million dollars later, they lost. Uh, and so we do get to make those determinations. And so I won't walk you through all the things that we have done to protect and defend the way that we're trying to protect free speech. What I can tell you is that, you know, we're green on the fire list. We signed up for the University of Chicago's, you know, principles, principles of free speech. We practice those. And, and we got people here that the University of Chicago haven't had at, on their campus in probably 100 years. Uh, and so they're all here. We have everything, every idea, every group you can possibly imagine everything going on all the time, and we make that work. There's no wood up here, knock on wood. We can keep everybody safe and keep everybody protected and keep the ideals of free speech in place, and we're trying very hard to do that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about uh, akin to this is I, I always want to do a program, and I, 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 I didn't get it going when I, when I was the director. I'm still affiliated with the uh, University of Chicago Institute of Politics, and I'd like to do it. Uh, in the future, but a program called Can Science Save Us and Can We Save Science? Uh, 
<laughs> well, can science save us? Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the last 400 years of history and compare it with the previous 50,000 years of history, the answer would be probably. Uh, but, but can it also kill us? You know, when the physicists at Alamogardo in July 16th, 1945, saw the weapon that they had built detonate, some of them fell to the ground weeping. And I'm like, to, to myself, I said, when I read these diaries, I was like, uh, what did you think you were doing? And so, and so what we have, what we have is we have insufficiently educated individuals playing with nature at an unbelievable level, CRISPR, fusion, AI, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything you can possibly imagine. Uh, and and I, I remember I taught a course at Columbia that was very revealing to me. So if you received an NIH postdoctoral or an NIH PhD grant to work on your PhD, you had to take a course on research ethics. And one part of the research ethics course was taught by me, the professor of science and technology policy at Columbia. So I'd come into a room of people about this size and they were all didn't want to be there. They didn't think they needed to be there. I start walking through basically their public duty. And I remember students would raise their hands. I don't have any public duty. I'm like, you're here because taxpayers in the United States are paying for your PhD. You have a public duty. What do you mean they're paying for my PhD? They're paying for your salary. They're paying for your tuition. People in the United States that work at ice cream shops and gas stations have paid for you to be in this room. And, you're, and you need to figure out that that they think that you need to have more responsibility relative to the research that you're doing. Mm -hmm. There's resistance in the scientific community. But what about resistance in the political community to science? You know, we saw it oh. during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I note the other day that there's been this uptick in, in measles, for example. Yeah, in Florida. Because, there's a, because there is a resistance to, yes, I noticed that too. Yes. <laughs> um, there, there's a resistance to a yeah. vaccination that does that worry you politicians the role that politicians are playing uh, you know if you look at and you're you're an astute student of american political history politicians are very similar in the united states because they are mostly lawyers farmers business people uh and and full-time politicians lifetime politicians uh there are not a lot of people that are that are scientists or engineers in our political arena there are in other countries including the country i was just in uh, and so what I worry about is, um, um, I guess I would call it, um, uh, arrogant denial. And so, so, so we have to, we have to start raising everyone's literacy level. So the vaccine, some of you might've taken a vaccine in the last couple of years. I've taken, I don't know how many vaccines. I mean, COVID, 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 COVID. Then the doctor says pneumonia. And then they say some other RSV thing. I have no idea what that is. Put it in my arm. I don't care. And so, and so. And so uh, uh, shingles, you know, that, uh, you know, once you turn 60, apparently we're all going to die of shingles. And so I put it in my arm. And so, and so, but I actually know what this stuff is. And so, so nobody knew what a messenger ribonucleic acid virus was to be defeated by a supercomputer designed ribonucleic acid vaccine designed to alter the DNA instruction set transference going on in your body. Like only one yeah, person. Yeah, I don't know why people wouldn't understand that. It seems so clear to me. And so, and so what we haven't done is we, we, we must figure out how to communicate. So in, in, in global climate change, I mean, I know, I personally know a lot of the scientists who, who sound bizarrely uh, maniacal to me by saying that the sky, the, the sky is coming to an end, the sky is falling, we're all going to die, it's all going to happen right away. And I'm like, you know, the, the planet used to be covered only with ice. And then another time it was covered only with water. And then another time it was covered with this and this and this. It's a very dynamic little ball that we live on. What we need to get people to understand is like, what is really going on? And we've done a really poor job of doing that. Let me ask you one question about that. And then I uh, just a couple of final yeah. uh, points. Um, uh, water is a huge concern. Yes. Uh, in this region. Yes. Um, are you doing work here that is relevant to that? And what is your level of confidence that that is an issue that science can overcome? Well, I'm 100% certain that we can deal with water distribution issues because it's a distribution issue. So there's lots of water in the atmosphere that's being, you know, we have a company that we spun out called Source that captures water from the atmosphere and it's purified when it's captured. Obviously, we have a water, some of our faculty that are in here have worked on water issues. We have a water innovation initiative 
we can change agriculture, we can change how food is grown, we can, we can change everything if we want to. If we're, you know, right now, we, we say, okay, let's take trillions of gallons of water and just pour it over massive areas of land by the square mile. We don't need all of that water, but we're gonna use all of that water, or let's, let's not recycle the water that the houses are using in ways in which you can, you know, just drink it again almost immediately, whatever. There's all, that, all of that science exists. We just have to decide that we want to do that. There's no shortage of water. In fact, I say to people, the same amount of water is on the planet today as was delivered by all of the, the, the rocks and the asteroids and the comets that delivered the water along the way. It's, there's no shortage of water. There's a shortage of thinking about water and creativity about water. Yeah. And we're working on all of that, everything. Um, you're also starting a, a hospital and a, a not a hospital. What we a just, medical research. Well, I mean, more important than what we're starting there is is it turns out that that if you look at what we learned during the pandemic, if you look at uh, you know the health outcomes, if you're a white female in the United States with a high school diploma or less, your lifespan is declining at the fastest rate of any group in the history of the country, ever. Uh, if you have a high school diploma or less, your lifespan is dramatically, dramatically less. I'm not talking about individual people. Uh, you know, I have siblings that didn't graduate from high school. And, and, and so I understand, you know, the different levels of, 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 uh, of educational outcomes. It turns out that we've done a terrible job of, of focusing our resources on outcomes versus focusing our resources on, on just a surgery or just this procedure. And so our ASU health initiative is building several new institutions, a new kind of medical school, engineering, AI driven, a new kind of public health technology school with tools like these wearable devices, all kinds of other things. So we're building a whole way, and our only measurement of success is not just the, the, the our, our measures of success are not just the student success and the research of the faculty, but did we actually public change? Did we actually change the health outcomes of the, mm -hmm. of the state? And that's the measurement. And no one's ever built anything with that as the measurement. So, um, I have two questions just as we go out. Uh, one is. Um, do you think this is a replicable model? Because it seems so much of it flows from just your sheer will. Yeah. Uh, well, well I, I certainly hope that it's not about me because I'm going to be dead at any point. And so, and so, you know, so. We only have a minute to go here. So yeah. hang, hang on. Uh, but but uh, <laughs> we have 17 universities or so in a thing called the University Innovation Alliance. Uh, I'm, I'm the chairman of that and the founder of that. Ohio State, Purdue, Michigan State, Central Florida. Oregon State, UC Riverside, uh, Maryland, Baltimore County, Virginia Commonwealth. I was just on the campus at Virginia Commonwealth a few days ago in Richmond. Uh, and, and so all those schools have decided we're going to learn how to innovate together. And all of us has decided that we can produce many more graduates, graduate more people, graduate more people from limited income families, graduate more minority students. And sure, sure enough, in the 10 years that we've been running this thing, all of that has happened. So is the model, are models replicable? Are there new ways to do things? Absolutely. Do you uh, allow yourself, I mean, the th thing that was astonishing to me was to read your origin story. Yeah. Uh, do you allow yourself, do you have time, because I know you're frenetic, mm -hmm. to say, ever look back and say, how the hell did this happen? How did I get here? And what, what would your, the aunt who was so unimpressed with your academic... Uh, Great grandmother. Oh, okay. Yeah. How, how, how would she... Uh, how would, how, would your, how would your family view all of this? With astonishment? No, I mean, you know, my family is one of those families where if you haven't seen anybody for two years, when you see them, just go, hey. <laughs> 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 my wife is from, a, her mother was a French, uh, French immigrant or an immigrant from France, and they're like kissing on each cheek and hugging. I'm like, what is this? And so... <laughs> So I've had to get used to that. <laughs> I mean, you actually touch each other in your family. So, so, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, what I, what I sort, I'm sort of a, a, a very serious student of history. And, and, and you look back through history and you see all these people in the United States that, you know, helped to do something, helped to think of new models of social work. If you read, if you read uh, the book Gotham, about the history of the city of New York between 1598 and 1898. Just read that book. You will be astounded beyond belief at what it took to make that city work and all the things that they went through and all the people that made changes and fought for changes and 
made things happen. And so, so what I see is that, is that it really is a function. You get this, you know, you get this short time of existence with, with other people. We're trying to advance the uh, democracy. So all, all I'm trying to do is just do my part. And my part is to help design a new way that a public university can be transformative to the United States. So I say this thing. So people, people have no idea what I'm talking about. So, so, you know, it's like funny, like the democracy here is nascent. Our republic is very, very young and unbelievable. So authority, for the last 50,000 years, until the last couple hundred years, most human beings lived in authoritarian states. They lived among despots and dictators and ruthless kings, even, even uh, beneficent, beneficent uh, 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 mm -hmm. dictators were barely that, and that was only for a while. And so, so here we are in the early stages of this democracy, and America has not yet built a truly, truly Tocqueville-like university. And so, so in this part of the United States, the 48 of the lower 48 states in this brand new, the rest of the world, the rest of the country thinks we're like nuts over here. Uh, you know, we're trying to emerge a different kind of institution. So I say to people, the institutions we need for the future aren't made yet. The best designs aren't built yet. And so, and so it's like each of us have this responsibility to do something toward that kind of end. So that's, that's yeah. how I sort of view it. Well, I would say that the future of democracy also depends on creating institutions that make opportunity as broadly available as possible and give people a chance to realize their full potential. Yeah, so here's a weird thing. So, so, so you hear all these, these falsehoods out there. They say, well, nobody in the United States wants to be an engineer. How many of you have heard that? I mean, a lot of people have heard that. And that's not true. Four times as many people want to be an engineer. Many more people want to go to college than go to college. Many more families want their people to go to college. So it's a family members. All the stuff you're hearing in the surveys and so forth, that's mostly frustration, disappointment, and anger at the inefficiency and expense of the system. Not that they don't want it. It's that they can't get it. And they're upset about that. So we figured out, for instance, how to, how to teach math in a different way, how to teach science in a different way, how to teach things in different ways, how to teach English in new ways, how to make things happen in different ways. It turns out that when you do that, I mean, a lot of fires get lit. A lot of people start moving forward and we start getting to the basis where you can start realizing, you know, the, 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 the truly egalitarian outcomes that the democracy was designed to help to achieve. And, and we're a part of doing that. We have a big stake in the success of that experiment. Yeah, we're trying. Michael Crow, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We, uh, we, if you have just one more minute, we, yeah, we have some questions. A couple of questions that I think were submitted by students. Uh, okay. And uh, one, I'll give you the easy one first. What is democracy in real life? Oh. Well, on my desk in my office is the Athenian Oath. And so it is uh, uh, carved into the wall of the graduate school that I went to at the Maxwell School for Citizenship and Public Affairs. And, and it, it's, it's, Athens was barely a democracy. It was the first place where a few people got to vote if you owned property and if you were of a certain age and you were, you know, 25% of the population were slaves. And it was just, you know, completely strange to think that somehow that was the and so the democracy is a place where, I mean, this is so obvious. I mean, the governance is by something other than a self-selected person. It's the governance by the people themselves. And we've, we've built a construct. We're advancing with that construct. And we're trying to make that construct work through, through all of the complexities that a truly democratic society would represent. I mean, so I, uh, I started, my interest in politics began when I was five years old. John F. Kennedy was campaigning for president in New York City. I lived in a housing development that was built for returning war veterans named Stuyvesant, called Stuyvesant Town. Mm -hmm. He showed up. It was 12 days before the 1960 election. New York was a, still a swing state. Yeah. Uh, and he uh, uh, jumped up on this platform. And among the things that, and I was a five-year-old and the woman who looked after me when my mother was at work took me and put me on top of a mailbox and I watched this whole thing. And he said, among other things, uh, I am not suggesting to you that if you elect me, everything will be easy. He said, being an American citizen in the 1960s is a hazardous occupation filled with peril, but also hope and possibility. 
and we will choose which direction we take in this election. Now, first of all, I didn't remember that from when I was five, so I know what you're all thinking. But this, will, but through the wonders of Google, speaking of technology, yeah, I found right. out what he, I found what he said. But the words are very meaningful to me because that is, to me, the essence of democracy. It's our chance as citizens to grab the wheel of history and turn it in the direction that we think is is right. And um, that is a sacred thing. And I was, in, uh, you know, I, I've been inspired by that ever since with all its imperfections. Uh, and uh, But it's also important. His brother, Robert, it's the epigram in my book, uh, said uh, the future is not a gift, it's an achievement. Yes, absolutely. And that's true of democracy as well. It was never meant to be a gift. It was meant to be a project, and it requires our eternal uh, engagement uh, It's in an it. evolution of human nature that goes beyond how we actually evolved. I mean, we evolved with, you know, unbelievable violence, unbelievable authoritarianism, and, and, and now we're not there. And so we're still struggling to make that work. So it is a, it is a continuous process that requires unbelievable vig vigilance. Which leads me to the next question. And I appreciate the spirit of the question. I'm not sure we, since we're contemporaries, are necessarily the best people to answer it, but it is how can current college students and young leaders remain confident and inspired to pursue a career in public service and politics when all of our current leaders, especially on a national level, are over 60 years old? Well, I mean, I understand the point of the question, which is like, you know, get out of the way. And yes. so, and so, uh, and so, yeah. And so it turns out though, that, that, you know, they're talking about positions that are filled. There's only two people in the United States that are elected by the country, the president and the vice president. Everyone else is elected by a place two each by state and then a number of the 435 by district. And then there's 50 state legislatures with two houses, except for Nebraska. Uh, and so, so, so uh, uh, it, it's, it's, they're, they're looking at too narrow of a conceptualization of the implementation of the democracy that, you know, in Ohio, they're passing, you know, unbelievable constitutional amendments from political action in different states. They're advancing all kinds of things. And, and, and so it's, it's the fact that the, you know, the, the two national you leaders know. were born either during or one year after World War II. Yeah, I mean, it, it might look like there's no room at the top, but the top is two positions. Yeah. Uh, no, and there, there is a lot of inspiring leadership uh, at all levels. Yes. But the point is, you can be, I don't know who asked that question. I, I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking that there are some people who are not qualified to ask that question. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, whoever asked that question, um, there you have the ability to make a difference, and uh, you can do it at the local level. You can do it at the state level. Uh, you can do it running for office. You can do it working for someone who does or someone who holds office. But you can do it as a journalist. You can do it in NGOs or community organizations. Judge. Yeah, a judge. There, there's so many ways in which you can make a positive difference in the public square and the totality of people of goodwill donating their energy and time to that is going to dictate the quality of our future. So the, the, this issue of democracy, it's an ongoing battle between cynicism and hope. And right now the cynics are on the march. And I think the social media world contributes to that and so on. It, right. Now it's, uh, it's up to us to fight for the other side. And, uh, and hope is not whether what you see right now makes you optimistic. It's, it's hope that we can do something better if we work at it. Uh, and, uh, but if you guys, if you young people, uh, wherever you are in this room, they could be watching. If you, if you young people are, uh, uh, surrender to the cynicism and lean out instead of leaning in, then we have a serious problem. Then our future is really jeopardized. So I, I hope that whoever asked the question will lean in. And yes, and, and you know, some of us uh, uh, fat ass older people move out of the way. Uh, and will because there's a lot of leadership and talent in this country. Some of it, a lot of it perhaps being created at Arizona State University. So yeah. again, thank you. Yes, thank you. And thanks all of you. Thank you.